love to you, Naomi. Ani, bonjour everyone. Naomi and Vishnakaz, Chippewas of Nawash and Dunjaba, Gigo and Dodum. That's in my traditional Anishinaabe Moan language. My name is Naomi and I'm Chippewas of Nawash and I am Fish Clan. And my community, Nia Shingaming, is just south of Tobamori, just north of Wyerton. And if you're in Canada, you know who Wyerton Willie is. And I am here today to share with you our Fanciful Feather Project. And this is actually um, a bead embroidery project that typically would take a fair amount of time to do. Um, but I have kind of broken it down into hopefully manageable little segments. And so um, we'll be kind of uh, going through this at a fairly quick pace, just so that I can cover everything that we need to know in order to uh, successfully complete the project. So welcome, thank you so much for sharing uh, Indigenous Peoples Day with me today. And if you're Indigenous, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I, it's really good to be here and I'm so happy to be able to share something that I'm very passionate about. I, I started beading when I was seven years old and so um, I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> There's always, of course, still more to learn and more to, to uh, uh, know. Um, and a lot of my work has like a historical basis. And so that may be reflected in some of the things that, that you, uh, you will be seeing today. Um, I actually have the document camera ready to go. And I just wanted to show and share a little bit of the little feathers that I've done and along with the project that we're going to be working on. So one moment while I do that. Okay, so here we are. We've got our lovely little collection of feathers. Um, this one here is fairly large. These are all hair pieces based on the project that we're doing today. And so I just wanted to give you a little visual insight over some of the different designs that we can do. So this one here is fairly large. This one I've actually, the little peyote tube can come off and go on. Just wanna make it a little bit different. And then there's ones like this. So the way we um, interpret a lot of our, uh, the natural world around us is very interpretive from the indigenous perspective. And of course, I am Great Lakes Woodlands uh, or also known as Algonquin. So uh, this is my traditional territory, this whole Great Lakes region, which means the Canadian and the American side. Um, so as I was saying, we, we all have our, our different um, cultural viewpoints and things like that. But for us Algonquin people, feathers are always one of those things that we highly value, especially if it's an eagle feather. And I did kind of give a little bit of a preamble in the PDF. But when someone gifts you with a feather, it's considered to be very special. And then oftentimes that happens when something like you've made a contribution to your community or you've, you've done something um, special for your community. Uh, oftentimes, one of the ways that we say thank you is we will, we will gift that person with a feather. So just, just some little insights as to why feathers are important to us. Um, and like I said, the eagle is especially uh, revered because it's considered to be the bird that flies the highest in the sky. And so um, we consider we consider him to be kind of like at the top of all of the birds. And so eagle feathers, of course, are considered to be quite precious. So I, I, I wanna uh, also say a thank you to uh, Michaels for inviting me today to share. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I I'm, was excited when uh, I was asked to design uh, our program for today. And so, as you can see, I did quite a few different little experimentations and, and that's what beading is for me. Like it, it's always about the journey. It's always about the learning and, and trying something new, something that you haven't done before. All right, so the focus of today's class is going to be this little feather hair barrette. And one of the things that I love about this is that it is a little bit interpretive in terms of the way it's designed. 
Um, eagle feathers themselves have sort of like a black or brown with white speckles. And so I sort of included that in how we put this together. I also wanted to make it something that wasn't too complicated for, um, for people to try. And it's flat embroidery. And I use the double needle technique, which I am also going to demonstrate today um, on not only on the actual samples themselves, but in large scale so that you have a really good understanding of how that double needle technique allows you to do full lines in a fairly uh, efficient manner. Um, to me, uh, it, for a lot of people that do bead embroidery, it is gonna be a game changer. It is gonna be one of those techniques where it's like, how did I not know how to do that before? So um, that's gonna be part of this uh, exciting little project. And, and like I said, I, I, it's, it's my, my go-to stitch anytime I'm doing uh, bead embroidery. All right, well, let's talk about how we go ahead to prepare to do the project. So I'm just going to make a little adjustment here. I've got all my little pieces. So whenever we're doing um, any kind of bead embroidery, we always want to make sure that we have a stiff enough foundation to support the beadwork. So this is actually a little bit of cuff that I did. And we actually have a, like a recycled plastic material on the inside to kind of support that beadwork. And that's one of the reasons why I was so excited that Michael's had the little thin plastic pieces uh, as part of their, their stock. Um, this is perfect because it's thin enough that we can bead through and yet strong enough that it can support any type of really heavy bead embroidery. So these are the considerations, especially if you're doing um, a more complex uh, type of beading. So when we go to put our foundation together, the other consideration is making sure that we have a furry base material to support the beading. And again, uh, there's a Createology uh, black felt that I picked up uh, at Michael's too that has a nice loft to it. It's got some stiffness to it. And so by sandwiching Hey, Naomi, let me know when you're back and I'll let you know uh, are you, when I can hear you. I did about it. And in fact, a lot of the basic hey, tools. That you, it cut yeah. out for just a second and we, we lost you after you uh, mentioned the sandwiching. Oh, OK. So what I was sorry about that. Sorry about that. What, that's OK. What I was what I was saying is that we want to create a little bit of a, a sandwich here of different layers in order to support that the beadwork. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You can use really simple tools for doing that. And my two go-tos for something like this, um, you can use like the Recollections glue stick. I also have the double stick scotch tape. This stuff is indispensable. Any kind of double stick tape is, is awesome for uh, this type of thing. And so basically in the PDF, I was talking about how you wanna create a couple of different layers. The other thing that I insist on whenever I'm beading is having a, just a piece of paper on the back side of whatever it is. So it could be the plastic, or it could be, you know, Ada cloth and then some cloth on top, depending on what your base that you want to bead on is. So in this case, all I want to do is I want to take the glue stick and I want to stick it onto the paper and then I want to stick the paper to the um, the plastic sheet that's that's that'll be listed in the PDF as well. Now this only has to hold until I start my first few stitches. Okay, so I don't. It doesn't matter to me if it, you know, kind of comes apart as I'm sewing, which sometimes happens. Um, once you start embroidering on it, it there's no. It's not going to come off. So I'm just going to stick that on there. And give it a little bit of a rub or a massage if you want. Now the felt needs a little bit more of a tack. 
sheets. And again, I, I don't have to go too crazy. I can just take my double stick tape and I can just put a couple little layers down. Again, I just want to hold that felt on while I start doing my project. So I'm going to put down three little layers. And again, it has to, whatever you use, it has to be easy enough that you can bead through. That's the whole idea here is that it's not, I have to be able to sew through it. So I'm going to take my felt and I'm going to put the felt down. And so I've got my paper on the back. I've got my plastic that's going to stabilize the beadwork and my felt that's going to cushion those rows also help hide my stitches um, on the top layer. And then basically at that point, I'm ready to bead. And we included in the PDF uh, a little sheet that has a template on it that just gives you a basic idea of what goes where. This can actually be used to um, become the, the pattern that you're going to follow or the template that you're going to follow for putting the first rows of beading down. And in this case, we're actually going to be starting in the middle section of our feather. So it, that would be the little bugles and this wonderful little howlite stone that we have here, uh, the eight millimeter stone. This is what we're gonna begin with. And then everything else gets built around that design. So for me, I only need a quick little indicator as to what goes where. So I don't actually even need the whole template itself. Um, I'm gonna minimize how much paper I'm gonna to have to bead over. So what I'm gonna to do to get started, I'm gonna trim out just the center part of this. And I can even, if I want to, I can shade in the bottom part that I will be using as well. Sharpie marker, another indispensable tool. So I'm just going to quickly shade this in because all I want to end up with is these rows, these straight rows where the bugles go and the bottom part so that I can shape the tip of the feather. Let me show you what I mean. So once I have my template ready to go, I'm going to trace it out so that I have cut off everything except those straight lines and then what I would call the inside of the feather. So that's going to be this part right here. That's all I need to get started. I already know that my stone is going to be centered on the top. Okay. So that's how I prepare my template. And again, you can put some double stick onto the back and secure it down. Uh, our, our old beaters, um, what they would actually do is they would baste with a bunch of little running stitches, uh, any of the little patterns or templates that they were gonna be beading over. Um, luckily today, we've got the double stick tape. We, we have tools that we can use that make the process a lot easier. Okay, so this is what I wanna start with. And I'm going to, as my first step, I'm gonna secure the little stone at the top. And I know that it has to be centered. So I'm gonna secure that stone up at the top and it has to be centered. Now, I suggested that we use um, fire line for that because it's a really heavy, heavy duty thread. So fire line, or sorry, wildfire, it's wildfire um, that you can also, uh, you can pick up at the store is a really wonderful, uh, strong thread, especially if we're gonna be securing an element such as a stone. And I don't even need a big piece of it. But before I do that, what I want to do, and this is another one of my little tricks that I particularly use when I'm securing stones, is this wonderful double-sided tape. Now, this is actually almost like a glue. Um, and it's very strong. 
and it will kind of hold that stone in place certainly long enough to secure it with the wildfire. So you just need a little bit of it and you're going to put that on the stone and I'm going to peel off the little red. That red part is just a little piece of wax paper to kind of keep the glue from sticking to itself. And I'm just going to make sure there isn't any sticking outside of the stone. And once I have it like that, this is great because this is going to help me position the stone where I want it to be and hold it while I prepare to stitch, stitch it on. So I'm just going to press on it, give it a good little press, make sure that it's secured. And I do want it to be centered. I want it to be centered in the middle of that white row that I have there. All right, so once I'm, I'm happy with it, it's the way I want. I don't have any of the sticky stuff sticking out. Now I'm going to take my uh, needle with the wildfire and I'm just going to use it single thickness. Like this is, this is um, a really good thickness. It's going to be very strong even as a single thickness thread. And anyone who knows me, I... I kind of go a little overboard with my knots. I like them to be nice and strong. I like them to be very bold looking because um, I don't want them to come out. So I'm just going to cut that off. I also do not cut right up to my knots. I always leave a little bit of a tail. This is going to be on the back side of my design and then it's going to be sandwiched in amongst multiple layers. So it's really not going to matter if there's a fairly decent tail there. Now, this is why I like the paper on the back. So sometimes I just want to make a little poke where I'm going to come up through the center of the stone. So I make a poke. When I turn it over, I can see where that poke is. And that allows me to come right up. So I'm going to come right up. And then what I want to do in this case is I'm going to come to the side of the stone and come back down. And I like to keep my lines fairly straight. So there's one side there with thread on the side of the stone. I'm going to come back up on the center and I'm going to go to the other side. So I'm going to come around. And I'm going to go to the other side. And again, I want it to be fairly centered. Sometimes it, they, they end up looking a little Y-shaped. But now I've just given that thread a tug. So I want to make sure it's nice and tight. Now I'm going to come up again from the middle. And I'm going to go back over to the side that I started with. So I'm kind of doing, if you want to think about it this way, it's almost like a little figure eight. And I only need to do this twice. I don't need to do it more than that because as I said, this is heavy, heavy duty thread. It's good stuff, especially if you're going to do um, very complex bead embroidery and things like that. And again, I'm just making sure I'm coming down in the right spot. And so I've given it a good tug. And now all I need to do is tie it off at the back. And that I can do by cap going underneath one of the sides of stitches. There'll be a stitch here and a stitch over here. You're going to go underneath with your needle. And then the loop that you create, you feed the needle through and you pull. And I want to do this at least three times. And then I'll have the confidence that I've knotted it really well. So, and one more. All right. So that just made sure it was nice and tight as I pulled on it. And there we go.
Hey, Naomi, is, can we do a close up of um of that uh, front of the of the stone? Say that again. Um, they were wondering if you could do a close up. Oh, of sure. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Can you? Here, let me just let me just refocus. Sorry about that. Is that better? That's perfect. Thank you. So now that it's sewn on, I am going to trim my my thread. And again, I always leave a little bit of a tail. I, I never want to cut right up to the knot because I don't want to cut into the knot by accident. And like I said, with a lot of our indigenous beadwork, it goes through a lot of wear and tear, especially if it's part of your regalia or dance outfit. So things have to be solid. And one of my favorite things to say to people, I'm always going on about it, I go, tight beadwork is good beadwork. Um, and, and that stands true today as well. All right, so that's what we need to do to, to actually get to a point where we're gonna start doing the beadwork. So I'm going to put the bead mat out. Just one moment. The bead mat's great for beading, but I don't want to uh, get it all covered with sticky stuff. All right, so once we've gotten to a point where it's ready to go now, and I'll, I'll hold this a little closer. So this is actually going to be the end of the feather, and we end up following that little piece after we put the bugles on. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to spot stitch the seed beads and the bugle because it's actually seed bead, bugle, seed bead on each side of the bugles. Okay, so seed bead, then the bugle, then the seed bead. So I actually need my white bugles. And those, of course, were listed in the PDF. I'm going to grab my white bugles. Now, by putting the seed bead on the, each side of the bugles, you're not only creating a decorative effect, but you are also um, protecting your thread from getting, uh, if the bugle edges are sharp at all, it can actually cut your thread. And so you want to make sure that you, you can kind of protect it or buffer it. Uh, with the seed beads. And so I put on a little bit of the weight. Now, the other nice thing about this project, um, a lot of my beadwork tends to be very detailed. And so I tend to use smaller seed beads. Um, so if I'm doing a really small project, I'll use like very, very small seed beads. This project, because of the, the style of it, the fact that it's kind of a little bit interpretive, we can get away with using the size 10. Um, and they're awesome because they, they work up really fast and they're a nice size for people, especially if you haven't done a lot of beading before. This will assist you by being a, little, a nicer bead size to work with, basically. All right, so this part here, I would use the wildfire for. So I'm going to cut off a piece. And we do not need a long piece. And one of the ways that I usually measure my thread is sometimes I'll say a wingspan. And a wingspan is fingertip to fingertip with your arms completely stretched out. Sometimes I'll say, oh, uh, measure from your fingertip to your shoulder of the same arm. Um, those are typical references that I will make. And in this case, we don't need a big piece. So I'm going to measure from my fingertip to my shoulder of the same arm, just so that I have enough. It's always better to have a little bit extra than um, not enough, which I know probably makes sense, but <clears throat> doesn't hurt to just clarify that. And I'm just going to grab my beading needle here. 
And I want to um, use this single thickness. Again, it's a nice thick uh, wildfire thread. And I'm gonna do a really big knot. So I tend to knot probably about three times. And then I, I, I feel confident. I feel like I've got a nice size knot. I'm gonna trim off the tail, leave a couple millimeters or an eighth of an inch. Now what I wanna do is I wanna start laying the bugles down following this template as best I can. Now they don't line up perfectly, but when I start, I can actually start in the middle of that row. I can start in the middle of that first row. What happens as you work down, um, you may end up with a bugle that kind of goes into the black part. We're going to use 11 bugles all together. And if it goes into the black part a little bit, no harm, no foul, it's all good. So again, I make a poke where I want to come up, turn it over. And because I've made a poke, I can actually see where I have to come up. I'm going to come up. My knot's at the back. And I want to start with my first row, which is going to be one black seed bead, one white bugle, and one black seed bead. And I always, always bring them down. I bring them down and I guess just kind of do a little thumb check. I make sure it's nice and tight. Um, this is leaning right up against my stone, which is perfect. And then I want to come down again at that halfway mark between that first linear section. So I'm going to come down and I should be at that halfway mark. If you're not, you got to take a look and make sure you are. The idea here is to have that bugle going straight across, and it is. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through it a second time. And because I have my little knot at the back, I have my little um, pokes from the first stitch that I did, it's pretty easy to see where I have to come up to go through this row a second time. And what this does is this reinforces it and it allows me to kind of give it a good tug and make sure that it's nice and tight. I want to make sure I'm coming back down where I'm supposed to be. Like this. And that's my first bugle. Now I don't need to cut my thread or anything, but I am going to crisscross. I'm now going to come back over. I like to work from this side to this side, like right to left or left to right, rather than coming, like some people go, well, why don't you go this way and then come across? I just find it's easier for me from a spacing, from a spacing perspective to just do it this way. And even if I end up with a bunch of zigzagging threads at the back, I'm okay with that. So now what I wanna do, um, again, I want to come half at the halfway mark where this next section is, make a poke, come up with my thread. And remember, my thread is going to zigzag. It is going to zigzag right across. So it started starting already. For my second row, it is going to be one white bead, one white seed bead, one bugle, and one white seed bead. So for those 11 bugles, we are going to be alternating between the black and the white. And again, this is just for more of a, an effect. This is a part of the design just to kind of give it almost like a, a checkerboard spotted kind of a look. And again, if you want to do your thumb check, you can do your thumb check. And I want to make sure that I come back down at that halfway mark. I want to keep these bugle rows as straight as possible. All right, so I'm going to come back up now, and I've got that beautiful paper on the back, which is my little buddy. It really helps. And where this comes into play the most is when we learn how to do the double needle applique. Um, this is a technique that I think a lot of people feel a little bit shy about at first. 
but it's also one of those techniques that once you've mastered it, it's really hard to go back to single needle applique where you're, you know, putting the beads on literally either in pairs or in groups of three. And it's, it's a very time consuming way to go. So this one here also can be done at the halfway mark. So I'm going to make a poke where I think it should be, turn it over, come up where the poke is. And I want to put on one black bead, one white bead, a sorry, bugle, and another black, black bead, black seed bead. And we're going to come down. So each one of these rows, I'm going to be going through twice. And that's just going to reinforce it. Got to find that halfway mark. So I'm going to carry on this way until I get that whole row of bugles done. And it's going to be 11, alternating between the black and the white size 10 O seed beads. And back down. All right, so I'm going to just skip ahead now and we're going to show you what we do next. All right, so once I've got all of those bugles secured, the next thing that I want to do is I want to bead around that inner part of my feather. So I want to bead around that inner part of the feather. And this is done using double needle applique. So if you have not done this stitch before, don't be shy. I really, really encourage people to do it because as I said, for doing the types of beadwork that I do, which is a lot of raised and flat applique, um, for those flat applique areas, you want to have a quick way of, that's still quality, um, of putting your work together. So what I want to do now is I'm going to actually show you in oversize, in an oversize model, how the double needle works. So bear with me. I'm just going to move a couple of things over. And I'm going to do this using the... Uh, a little piece of felt here. I'm going to be using the pony beads. So these are little plastic pony beads. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really good for kids. They're just a lightweight bead. But they're also great for giving people an up close and more detailed view of certain um, techniques. So in addition to that, I am going to need two needles, hence the name double needle. And I refer to these in two different ways. The first needle that we actually feed the beads on is called the feeder needle, and it is double thickness. So you can see right here, I've got my two sides of my thread tied together, and I've and I've got it double thickness. So this is the feeder needle and it is double thickness. The second needle that I need is called the couching needle. And I just also want to add in that there's different names for different techniques and even the, the way we do the stitches. Um, not everybody calls this a couching thread, but if you have a needle arts background, you'll understand what couching is. And I don't ever say anybody is wrong. Like if someone said, oh, I learned that as a such and such a technique, then that's how they learned. And I respect that. Um, I can only share things using the terminology that I'm familiar with. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. So this is the couching thread and it is single thickness. So you can see that my knot is only on one part of it. And we're going to need both needles to do our straight row of flat double needle 
uh, technique. So I want to take the feeder needle and as you were probably uh, figuring out, I'm going to make a little poke, turn it over, and I'm going to come up where that poke is. Now, sometimes when I'm starting a row, I will do what I call a little lock stitch, where I come ahead, not even an eighth of an inch, like just like a millimeter and a half. It's a very small little going forward. Now, this is specific to which hand is your dominant hand. So if you are right-handed, if your right hand is your dominant hand, that is the hand that's going to do the couching. If you're left-handed, like I am, then my right hand is going to be the one that holds the feeder thread, and my left hand is going to be the one that does the couching. So my non-dominant hand will be the one that's holding the feeder thread. Okay. So I've got my feeder thread ready to go. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to put a whole little row of beads. Now, depending on the area that you're covering, you may put on possibly, you know, a centimeter and a half or an inch and a little bit. You do not need a whole bunch of beads because it has to be manageable. And what I mean by that is your non-dominant hand has to be able to kind of hold that feeder thread while you're getting ready to do your couching stitches. And so the idea here is that we're going to, with the couching thread, we're going to actually couch over the feeder thread in between the beads that we're trying to stitch down. And again, this is where having that paper backing, like I, I'm so glad I started doing that a few years ago because it's just been so helpful. So I want to couch, let's say, every two to three beads. I'm going to make a poke where I need to come up. And this is my couching thread. This is the single thickness thread. The camera a little bit here. So I've made a poke. I'm going to come up. And I'm going to go over those first two beads with my couching thread. So it's going to go over. And what it's going to do is it's going to snap over the feeder thread in between the beads. So I need to make sure I'm actually on the other side. Now, some people have asked, well, do you need to go through the same hole? No, you do not. Um, there's a lot of times where my holes are not even remotely beside each other or close to each other. So there you can see that the couching thread has snapped over the feeder thread and it's holding those first two beads in place. Now I'm going to do the same for the next two set two beads. I'm going to come up and I'm going to go over. So I'm going over that feeder thread and I'm going to come back down to the back. And every time I do that, there's a little loop of thread that's going to hold those beads on. So that feeder thread is being secured plus the beads with that couching thread. And like I said, if you're not accustomed to this, I do recommend you try it because it is such a nice way to fill in areas. So I'm going to come up. And I'm going to go over. All right. So I know that at having two needles to look after might be a little bit daunting at first. But the truth is that your feeder thread really doesn't do a lot anyway. I basically just hold it with my thumb. I've got it maybe wrapped around a finger. Um, and it sort of stays away. And most of the time, it's out of the way. You don't even have to worry about it. Typically, your couching thread is going to be at the back unless you're coming up and couching over something. So that is two needle. All right. And that's what I actually like. I use this technique for most of my bead embroidery projects. So I'm going to put those aside. 
And what we're going to do now is actually put that into practice on the actual project itself. So what I want to do is I want to, using the double needle, I want to go around the tail end of the feather. I'm going to go around the tail end of the feather. So I need my two needles. Naomi? Um, yes. In the chat, they were asking if they could see the back of the piece that has the, um, the couching thread. The oversize? Yeah. Thank so you this so is the this is the couching thread that you see there. And typically the only time I think we lost sound for just a second there. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, we heard um, right up to the, the part where you were showing us the back. Um, what I was saying, when we're ready to do our double needle applique or double needle method, you don't need to have big, long um, cuts of thread. And in fact, for the feeder thread, if you keep it maybe about from your fingertip to your elbow in length, that's, that's a good idea. You don't need to have a big length of it. So what I've done now is I've actually switched over to the Nymo D, which I believe was also listed in our PDF. Um, I just like the Nymo D for doing this type of embroidery. Some, uh, some indigenous beaters use the heavier thread, uh, the wildfire. Um, I do for edgings, I do for anything that's going to be heavy duty or under stress, but for just filling in the feather, um, my Nymo D is perfect for that. So this is the feeder thread. It's, it's a little bit longer than I normally do it. Um, I was kind of talking at the time, but it's, it's actually still fairly short. It's just an arm length. So that's the feeder thread. That's the, the double thickness one. And then the next thing that I want is my couching thread, which is going to be the uh, one that's single thickness. And I'm gonna keep this one short. I'm gonna keep it from my fingertip to just where my shoulder is on the same arm. And this one, of course, is only going to have one knot. Now, when you're taking your 9 D off the bottom, off the bobbin, it's a good idea to give it a little stretch um, to get those curls out. So you can always give it a little bit of a stretch, get those curls out, and then you won't have to worry about your thread twisting. All right, so there's my couching thread all ready to go. So in this case, I want to fill in the line that goes around that part that I colored in in marker on my template. So I'm going to be filling around this part here. You can sort of see it on my on my template there. And it's a straight row of beads. Now, I, I designed this feather not to be something that you had to follow to the letter in terms of, you know, what kind of sequence of beads that you're going to use. If you want to follow the pattern, you can, but a lot of the times, um, a lot this part here that we're going to be doing right now is fairly random. If I want to add in a white bead, I can add in a white bead. If I don't want to add in a white bead, that's okay too. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and what I want to do is I want to 
put the beads just on the inside edge of the template. And again, because I have the paper on the back, it's really going to be helpful. So I need to actually come in about a half a bead of space, and that's relative to the bead that I'm, I'm using. So I'm just going to make a poke. I'm going to come up where that poke is. If you want to, you can do a little lock stitch. For me, that's just uh, one way to just not totally have to rely on my knot to hold. And like I said, when you're creating beadwork that's going to be used for a whole bunch of different things, um, for dancing, for um, you know, dressy occasions, uh, you want to make sure that you have um, everything as reinforced as you can. So here's my feeder thread. And what I want to do is I want to put on some black and maybe a spot of white and some black. And again, you just do what you think looks good. Totally up to you. And I want this to be sitting on the inside edge of the template. So the edge of the template is right here where my thumbnail is. And I want to sew that so it's on the inside edge. And you can, I've had my hand trained already. It's already got the thumb there. It's holding that right in place. And I'm ready to start doing my first stitches. So my couching stitches are going to start from the outside edge and they're going to go to the inside. And I've made some little pokes so I know where to come up. And I'm going to come up. And I want to couch right about here. And I'm going to come down on the inside of that template. So I'm going to come down on the inside of the template. And I'm going to come back up again. And I'm going to come down. So this part here has to be filled in before we can build the rest of our feather around it. And I'm going to come over like this. Make another poke because I don't think I ran out of pokes. And I'm going to come up and over. And so I'm just following, like I said, the just on the inside of the template. So here's what it's going to look like. So once I've done that, I'm going to end up with this little straight row of beads that basically is on that little edge of that part of the template that I cut out. Remember, I cut out just this row and that little end there. And what this does is this gives me that foundation to build the rest of my feather around. So what does that mean? That means that when I'm ready to do my next row, which is going to go around the turquoise stone and around that little tail piece that I put and back up. That's what I need in order to start building the rest of the feather. And if you look at the sample, I do that little row and then I can do this row here. There's only three little outer rows. The second row is where I start adding in my turquoise and I'm still going around following the feather. My outer row is going to be the 10 black, which again is following the feather. But this is so, um, it's almost, I guess, modular in how I approach it. So once I've done this, what I want to do next is I want to add on my little quill part of my feather, the little part that comes out of the bird and attaches the feather to the bird. 
And this is the only time I use my 8Os. And I know you could do it in size 10 if you wanted to. I just like it having a little more presence. Um, and it kind of sort of balances out the boldness of those bugles. So to do that, it's just a straight row. It might be a good idea to use your uh, wildfire for that. And then you know that it's secured well. So I know that I need five of those. So I'll just put a few little ones on there. And it's going to be a straight row that just comes straight up. Now, sometimes I use like a metallic gel pen. You can't see it, but there's a little metallic gel pen line that kind of um, divides this into the center so that I know that I'm kind of in the middle and I've got enough room for all of my beaded elements. That's important. It's important to have that. So I'm just going to grab, I had a little, a little scrap piece of uh, fire line handy there. I know it's uh, crazy, but if I know that I'm going to have little parts of my, my project to do, I will save that fire line for that part. And I just need a little bit to put that quill part of the feather in. And it's just going to be one straight row. I may later on, if I think it needs it, I could tack down in between those beads. But usually it's okay to leave it just, just the way it is. And I'm going to come up from this part up to here. And I already kind of have the center mark of my feather penned in with the metallic gel pen. You could use a white one too, but you just want to make sure if you make any markings that you're going to be able to conceal them uh, on your outside part of your feather. So I'm going to make a mark. I'm going to come up where that mark is. And I've got to put on five of these white size 8 -0 check seed beads and I'm going to put on one size 10. So six beads all together, two different sizes and you can see how it almost makes the end of the feather look a little more narrow, which is what I want. And I'm going to come down and I want to make sure this lays flat. So sometimes you can do pull on your thread and do a little thumb check, come ahead just a little bit. Those, those beads need a little bit of breathing room in order to, to lay down flat. So now I'm going to go through this at least twice. And once I'm, I have it on there the way I want it, then I can, I can secure it at the back. I'm just going to see if I can go through this one more time. Because basically this whole row of beads is being held on by three strands of wildfire. Like this. Come down. And give it a good pull. Make sure it's nice and firm. Do the thumbnail check. If it's not wiggledy-piggledy, you're good. I'm going to turn it over. And now I'm going to go underneath all of those stitches and tie off. And you know I like to do this at least three times, sometimes four, depending on my mood. I just want to make sure that it's going to be well knotted and secured. Give it a good pull and cut. Always leaving a little bit of a tail. So now what happens, once I have that first inner key line going around the feather, and the quill installed. Now I can start building in that second row that has the turquoise with the white and the black. Now in the PDF, I did give you, like I said, oh, put on like, you know, eight of this, 20 of that. It, it's totally up to you if you want to follow that or not. It will not make a difference to the outcome of your feather. In other words, it won't 
um, make it look funny or anything like that. And in fact, I think it's a really great idea to experiment and play. Um, once you know how to make these, they're so much fun. And I, I would always recommend you to make another one. Uh, my Seneca elder, uh, Yvonne, always said, make something twice and then you'll retain how to do it. And I think that's wonderful advice. I really do. All right. So I would go ahead now and I would starting on each side of the quill, I would put on that, that outer row. I can get one started. And then I'm going to talk about how to finish off the feather. And I'll show you, I actually did do a, I did do an interesting variation on the feather. So I've got my turquoise beads out. Size tens are awesome. And again, this is going to be applied this row here uh, using that double needle technique. And you know by now, you have to have your two needles. So there's my two needles. Put one of the other little samples aside. And again, I don't need a big amount of thread. I, for my feeder, I have to have enough to go around this space. So I'm just gonna measure off from my fingertip to my shoulder of the same arm for my feeder thread. And then I am going to, for my couching thread, I think I can measure off the same amount from my fingertip to my shoulder of the same arm. Now, when I'm talking with people about how to put something together, so there you go. I wouldn't want any smaller than that, but this is a nice manageable size. When I'm talking about measurements to people, like I'll always say, oh, put it a bead of space away. It's actually a great way to measure things because it's relative to the bead that you're using. It's relative to the materials that you're using. Like if you're using a size 10 and I say make it a bead of space away, you know automatically what that spacing is because you're just going to take your bead and you're going to go, oh, that's what she means. She needs a bead of space away. And I think that's just, it's one way to maintain consistency. Again, because it's relative to the materials that you're going to be using. Like if I said for size eight, if I said put that a bead of space away, that again would be based on that size, that size of bead. All right, so once I have my first inner key line around. I'm going to want to move on to doing the second key line. And then the last part, of course, would be that black, that black key line. So after the bugle part and the little front part or bottom part of our, our feather, it's actually the top part of the feather, pardon me, there's only three other rows to go around your feather. And I typically do the quill part separate. I kind of do that part on its, on its own, all right? And in fact, if I wanted to, I could, uh, I could do that anytime. I could do it now, or I could do it after I put that second row. So we are talking about the second row, which is the part that has the turquoise in it. Okay, so now, when you do this, you typically want to start where you have to go around. So you're going to start here and you're going to have to come all the way around and stop there. So I'm going to make a poke and I'm going to come up where that poke is. If I want to, I can do a little lock stitch. And again, that's just a 
I call it cheap insurance that my knot's not going to pull out. And if it does, I've got that extra loop. So the first thing I want to do is I want to start off with my white. And my white, I believe, is like 20, 20 beads. Um, if you want to follow it specifically, I believe it's notated in the PDF, the quantities for going around the second key line. This is one of the reasons why I probably wouldn't succeed at doing uh, some loom work. Um, I'm very much a color outside the box kind of a person. And so I like to, I like to experiment. I like to use unorthodox materials. I like to um, not have to follow a specific pattern. I'm very much about maintaining some kind of a, a creative license for lack of a better. I'm just gonna put 15 on and check. Probably easier. Okay, that works. So you can see how I'm just going to come up. So typically what I would do is I would couch this first before I start getting into the other colors. Again, it's just because you don't want to have a long row of beads to have to manage. You want to make sure that you have enough beads to make it worth your while, but not so many that they become difficult to control. You don't want to have to be fighting with your beads. So again, I'm going to come up, over, and when you're first learning, it doesn't hurt to say come up on the outside, go down on the inside, depending on which way you go. Normally, if I'm following a shape, I'll come up on the outside and I'll go down on the inside. So I'll come up on the outside, I'll go down on the inside. And then I'm going to add in my, my turquoise now. I've basically just couched up to the last two beads. And my turquoise, oh, actually, you know what? It's going to be two, two black, two white, two black, then the turquoise. Now I'm going to put, so it's going to be turquoise, black, turquoise, black. And I'm going to put those down. And then the next part of it is another turquoise and another black, and then a solid row of eight turquoise. And you can see how, like, I'm not a fan of having to sit there and pick at my beads. Typically what I'll do is I will have them so that they're in little piles. Because what I want to do is I want to scoop them. I want to be able to just skim the surface of the, uh, the bead mat that I'm using. And this is perfect when you're doing multi color or multi bead projects. Um, just having a nice bead mat where you can just sort of put everything out, you can kind of see it all at once. Um, for the feather, I, I did make sure that I didn't use go too crazy. Um, but certainly for the center part where the turquoise stone is, you could put a little antique sew on, you could put a metal bead in there. There's so much potential for doing something uh, unique for that top part of the feather. And again, it just adds a nice little flourish. So I've co couched up to there and I know that I need eight turquoise and then I need a series of black to go around the tip. And again, that's just in keeping with um, as sort of an indigenous interpretation of what an eagle feather will look like. I'm going to bring these down. 
And so basically, in order to finish this, I'm just going to just go all the way around. I know I've got to change to my black soon. So I'm going to go black all the way around and then change to the turquoise and repeat this sequence as best I can for the other side. And of course, when I finish something, um, I will bring the um, couching thread and the feeder thread to the back and that will allow me to tie all three threads together in one go so that it's nicely secured. Once I get Hey Naomi, we lost your sound for just a second there. Just wait until you're back. Are you still there? Samples, which I'm going to oh, show. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. We lost your sound just a second ago, but you're back um, now. Where did I end off? Um, you were just uh, starting the turquoise uh, editions there. Oh, so what I was saying is that I just keep going. And then what happens, uh, I keep couching all the way around until I get up to here. And then I bring my feeder thread and my couching thread all to the back at the same time. And they all get tied together in one go. And then I was saying that the outer last key line going around the feather is solid black. And typically what I do is I would start up here, I go around the feather part, stop, then I would do my quill part of the feather in two separate rows that are not attached to the rows that are going around the main part of the feather. And then I was saying, if you wanna to stick to the model, then I explained how that's going to be that solid row of black. And then I said, however, you can get really creative. And I'll show you one of my other samples here. So here's one where I did the outer row as the, um, instead of the solid black, I actually did it as the turquoise. And again, you just, you want to have fun with it. You want to experiment, you want to, you know, get really creative. So once I have this whole part done, I did do the part of the quill at the top um, in the black. I want to fill in this with just some straight rows of the double applique. So I would just use straight rows of my double applique. And that will be um just filled in two needle really quick gonna steal one of my needles here and once that's done then we're ready to talk about how we want to finish it off and that's going to be interesting because a lot of the times my designs can be um multi-purpose, I guess, is probably the best way that I can describe it. So I don't typically do designs that are just, you know, just a pair of earrings or just a, you know, um, medallion. A lot of the times I'll have them so that they can be appreciated in a variety of different ways. And a lot of our Indigenous earrings are pretty large anyway. So you could make two feathers and those that could make a nice little pair we call them powwow earrings it just means that they're big and bold um you can make yourself a nice little pair of powwow earrings which would be of course everybody's going to admire them they'll be like you know watching that and going look at that girl's bling i was also thinking like the feather would be great as a pendant definitely could do that. Um, I, I had to finally get my COVID hair cut a couple months ago. Um, up to that point, it was literally down to my tailbone, um, which is how I like it. I normally try to keep my hair long, but about a foot of it was just nasty. So it had to go. So then I thought, oh, I just all of a sudden I need breaths. I need breaths to keep my my, my shorter hair out of the way. And so that was 
part of the inspiration for creating the little barrette so that I could have um, a nice little hair accessory. That's what I was thinking of as I was designing this for you. So here, in this case, to fill in the end of the feather, I'm going to start on the outside and work towards the middle. And this is the part where you can really have fun. There's no set way to do this. Just that typically, because the feathers, if they're not solid brown, they will be a mix of the black and white. And so I can do a, a totally random black and white, however I want. Again, it's up to you. So in this case, I'm going to still couch into here. Oh, that's kind of interesting how it's lining up. Oh, cool. All right, so here I'm just going to make my pokes. I'm going to come up. And I go right over that row. Now this one here, um, I can try and go all the way around if I want to go all the way around in that U shape. Or I can just do rows. I can just do rows at the flat applique. Whatever, whatever works best. And like I said, you can be really, really random. It does not have to be any particular sequence whatsoever and in fact it's kind of nice if we all would make different ones because it'll make that one sort of unique so i think i'm going to put another white bead here and a couple more black and it might be a little a little tight turning the corner but i'm going to try I got to get into that corner there so you can see it's a little bit of a tight squeeze we but we got this we can do this this time i'm going from this side so i'm going from the inside to the outside like this now i got to get right in here so this is parts where you um, you kind of need to have a thumbnail, a literal thumbnail. I'm going to come up and get right into that corner and come down. And I want to make sure that I'm not spreading out my beads. I'm going to make sure that they're, that they're not crowded and that they're laying flat. All right. So there we go. Got that one in there. And then now I'm coming over onto the other side. You can see how it's kind of pointy. That's okay. I'm going to make a little poke. And I'm going to come up where that poke is. And come over and secure this other side. So, whoo, turn the corner. That's awesome. So now I'm going to put on another white bead. And then a whole bunch of little random black ones. I'm not even counting. I'm just scooping. Put on another little white one. Let's see how far this is going to go. That's so funny that my white ones keep lining up. Totally not doing this on purpose. All right. So I'm going to make my pokes. I'm going to come up over that row of beads up over that row of beads what's going to end up happening because i don't want to make my beading too crowded i am going to end up only putting one row down the middle once i get up to the top here and i think at this point the easiest thing to do would be to add on a white and two black beads and then we're probably probably have enough so this is where i'm going to show you how i would actually just tie it off so i'm going to come to the back with my feeder thread like this and you can see it just fills in that space nicely so my feeder thread is at the back and i want to just make sure that it's not interfering with my couching thread 
make a poke, come up with my couching thread. Typically what I do is I make sure that I couch right up to the last bead so that I don't have too much of a gap from where my feeder thread is and my couching thread is. So I'm going to come over like this. Once that's done, now this is the part where I was going to show you where we tie off. I'm basically tying all three threads together at least three times. Hi, Naomi. We've had a couple requests to see a close up, and um, we just had one other question about uh, the order of um, wondering is there a reason that the center is filled in last? Uh, yes, because I'm not sure how many rows I'm going to need. So if I fill it in last, then I can better gauge how much I'm going to need to fill it in. And in fact, even though I tied off, um, I can actually just come right in the middle here and I can put that center row in. And like I said, you don't want your beads to be sandwiched in too tight. Um, Danielle, was there another question or did I answer what was question oh, yeah thank you yes you answered it um and the other question was they were just wanting to see a close-up of this beautiful piece uh the one i'm working on or the finished yeah, one just maybe holding it up maybe a little bit still for just a second is that okay that's beautiful yeah thank you oh you're welcome and so my center one's just going to go right in the middle it looks like i need maybe four beads and I always do a little check. I just want to make sure that I have enough beads in there. It's looking good. I'm going to add one more. And I'm actually just going to, because I'm feeling confident, I'm going to bring that feeder thread right to the back now. And you can see how my little row just fits in there nicely. I do have to couch it still. That row still needs to be couched, but you wanna make sure that this isn't too crowded. All right, so a little bit of breathing room between your rows. Like sometimes people go, oh, I think I can squeeze another one in there. Don't do it. You won't like it. It, it'll, it won't look nice. And so now I'm just gonna put in my little pokes so that I can couch. And then, what we want to talk about really quickly is um, how we're going to finish off our feather. That I believe is also fairly clearly outlined in the PDF. But when you put the backing on, again, it's another case of where it's sort of a sandwich situation. So it's kind of sandwiched. So I'm going to couch right up to the end here. Go over that last bead and then tie all those threads together at the back. There you go, you got a chance to see this a couple times, so that's good. All right, so I'm gonna do this at least three times because I'm going to be cutting my thread. So I wanna make sure my knots are not gonna come out. Okay, once that's done, now I'm just gonna cut this I'm going to leave a tiny, 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 tiny little tails. I don't know if you can see them. Tiny little tail there. Always, always, always. Now what I want to do is I want to prepare my barrette for putting the edging on. And this too is a variety of different little steps that we have to do. Um, I'm going to use the felt. So I want to use my piece of felt again. Only this time what I want to do is I want to put um, a little backing of Ada cloth. I want to put the Ada cloth on because I want to strengthen that felt. Um, and then typically what I'll do is I will put a little piece of paper in there so that I have a way of tracing around my feather. So this is actually shown in the PDF where what I want to do now is I want to cut the, around the perimeter of the feather to get it ready to go on to the backing. Hey Naomi, we had a question about um, the couching. Is there a specific number of beads or is it just kind of random how many you string before 
If, it, if it's a straight row, Danielle, we can do every three to four beads. If it's a curve, I recommend every one to two beads, depending on how complex the shape is. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So I want to probably leave just a little bit of space, like not even an eighth of an inch. And you notice I quick cut first. I quick cut first because I want to actually get rid of all of the extra pellon or felt or velveteen, whatever it is I'm using. Um, I want to get that all cut off so that there's no extra material showing. And then that's going to give me, sorry, I just had to get a little closer to my little feather here. That's going to give me the pattern that I need for the backing. Sorry, I have to cut a corner here. We had one more question from earlier asking, um, is it difficult to cut around the piece? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I'm just make sure because you're cutting through the plastic, you need to just have nice sharp scissors. And Michael's has a really good selection of the Fisker scissors. They, they tend to be my, my scissor, my go-to scissors. Um, there we go. All right, so again, you wanna make sure that when you're cutting this out, that you're not cutting into any of your sewing at the back. Make sure you're staying away from the stitching, okay? So that's just one little thing that you wanna keep in mind. Okay, I'm just gonna get the backing materials here. And like I said, if you get that that um, heavy, heavy felt they have at Michael's, it's really, really good for this type of thing. So I'm just gonna take my felt and I wanna put a little patch of Ada cloth. Um, you, can, you can tape it, uh, you can glue it, whatever, whatever works. Just a little piece of Ada cloth. And I also wanna just see how much I'm gonna need. So it looks like I still have to go this way but I only need a tiny little patch of this. And like I said, this is just gonna make sure that you have a reinforcement. My trusty, it'll be our little secret um, double stick tape. I'm serious, this is like my, my go-to thing. And I'm, gonna, and I'm just gonna put it on there. Um, if you want to, you can put on that little piece of paper. Like literally anytime I'm doing something, I always have a piece of paper on the back. That's just, again, uh, a great little thing to have. I'm just gonna grab one. Don't know where my bigger sheet went. Make it about the same size. And this is the part where that awesome, awesome, awesome tape. I just absolutely love this tape. Um, it's gonna play a role in this final part of our project. And we like I said, don't, don't- Sorry, we had another ahead. question just pop up about- um, That's okay, no problem. Could you use linen or like a heavier muslin in place of the Ida cloth? Sure. I'm just putting it in there because I want to reinforce the felt. I just want to make sure that the felt, I don't want the felt to um, be compromised. Like with a barrette, you're going to be um, taking it off and on. And this part here goes through a certain amount of wear and tear. So you need to make sure that you have the felt reinforced. So I'm going to put this on here and I'm going to trace it. I'm just going to take my Sharpie marker. And this is going to give me my pattern for my barrette. 
you know, I, I suppose you could just draw on the Ada cloth, but the paper gives it a nice little bit of stiffness as well, because we've got the black felt, we've got the Ada, and we've got the piece of paper. So now what I want to do is I'm going to trim this out. Before I add the edging, I need to, and I'm pretty sure this won't surprise anyone, I need to secure my barrette. My barrette has to be stitched on first before I can start doing my single beaded edge. Now, speaking about edgings, edgings are one of those things that go by a variety of different names, especially what I call two bead or double beaded edging. Um, they can go by a variety of different names. So you wanna be aware of that. Okay, so there we go. I've got it cut out. I'm going to do a quick check just to make sure that it there isn't any part that's glaringly too large. I could trim off a little bit here. Even if I cut it a little bit small, it, it'll still be okay. There's a certain amount of forgiveness here in terms of... <clears throat> All right, so now, woohoo, awesome. Okay, it's going together perfectly. Now I want to put on my barrette piece. And this I would use the fire line. I'm also going to use some of my beauty little tape here. Remember, this tape is like a glue, it will literally hold everything together. And I, I typically I have more rolls of this in all sorts of different sizes. So I'm going to put that on the barrette back first. So just going to put it right on there. Cut off at an appropriate length here. And there it is. It's right on there my handy dandy gluey tape and go back into its little package. So what I'm going to do now is take the fire line and I will stitch the, sorry, wildfire. I will stitch that to this. Got to grab that little thing off of there. It's, that's a great cover for that, by the way, because there's nothing worse than having your thread unroll itself. Now, because we're using a size eight for the edging, you'll want to make sure that you um, if you have to upgrade to a slightly larger needle, you can do that. But Typically, to be honest with you, uh, these short beading needles, as referenced in the PDF, are perfect for Hey, Naomi, we've lost your sound again. Uh, at the part where you were telling us um, that it's what, what it's perfect for. Oh, sorry. What was that? We lost your sound right about where you were saying it's perfect for. Uh, for the um, the size eight seed beads and the barrette there. Oh, the 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 small needles that we were reference in the PDF are perfect for all of these different tasks, in my opinion. Like some, I don't even sometimes bother switching to a larger needle. Okay, I just want to make sure I have this on correctly, and I do. And that tape is so awesome. It's already basically sunk into the felt. It's all good. And I'm now going to just very quickly stitch this to my bottom, my backing, my backing of my barrette. So again, these types of embroidery 
uh, projects. Um, these can be like a day, they can be like a half a day, uh, depending on, uh, sorry, my wildfire here just nodded itself. Um, they're not like typically very fast, okay? And so that's why when we put this together, we were really thinking on how we can streamline this so that everybody can see what to do. So here's one of my little tricks. So I've secured this side. Rather than cutting my thread and re-knotting it, I'm gonna carry my thread all the way over. And I mentioned this in the PDF because what this does is this also gives me a thread to tie off with. So I'm gonna pull that tight. It makes it a little more stable and strong too. Because I, I, I looped through this, I whip stitched this probably six or seven times and again i just want to make sure that this is going to be nice and solid um danielle should i talk about the edging technique or are we um you know oh we're happy know. to see that and hear about that um is that okay absolutely yeah oh awesome that's wonderful all right, so this now gives me a length of thread to tie off on at the back. And you know the drill, it's at least three times. I just loop it through, give it a good pull. Sometimes people go, oh, like, you know, you're such a bead artist. And it's like, I'm actually, sometimes I think I'm more of a bead engineer. Because there's always these, all these little parts you have to consider and how things go together and all those sorts of things. So that's typically how I would do my backing. And you can see my barrette's nice and solid. It's well stitched. So what I want to do now is I want to put the two together. And if you have one of those tiny little bulldog clips or office metal office clips, they are perfect for this kind of thing. They really and truly are. Um, if you don't, you can take a little bit of your tape. This is my other favorite little trick. And you can stick the two together. And that'll do the same as the... Bulldog clip. So I'm going to give it a bit of massage. Sometimes, um, depending on the tape... Some tape, not this, some tape doesn't like to stick to the to thread for some reason, some of the beading thread. And I think it's because some beading thread has a coating on it. And so I had to get my thumbnail in there. In this case, all I want to do is I want to hold these two ends together till I get started. a little bit easier to put it on here. So I'm going to peel that off. And again, I don't need to sew through this. So now I'm going to put the barrette together. And that double stick uh, gluey thread or gluey tape is going to hold that together while I start putting on the edging, the, the edging technique that I'm going to use, which is single. All right, so once that's all together, give it a little squeeze. I need my black size eights. And this is also where you probably want to use one single thickness of your beading thread, which is going to be uh, the wildfire. And I want to have at least, I would say, a wingspan, just so that I have enough. Uh, it might be overkill, but I want to make sure that I have enough to go all the way around. You can patch in thread. That's definitely a possibility. But I highly recommend that you just cut the length or more than a length that you're going to need. But this is the wildfire single thickness.
and I need my size eight uh, black seed beads. And those, because they're a larger bead, those little black beads give a nice finish. So I just did a single knot there. It does a nice finish on your barrette. Barrettes shouldn't be fussy. There shouldn't be like lots of dangly do's and things like that because when you're pinning them onto your hair, you want to make sure that they're not going to get tangled or snagged into anything. So here's my size eights. I'm just going to plop a bunch here. Now, I always want to hide. I want to hide my knot on the inside. I'm going to hide my knot on the inside. So if you think about this as a little Oreo cookie, the little knot's going to hide on the inside. And then I'm just going to do one loop of thread that's going to join the back to the front. Like this. So now what I want to do is I want to put on my first bead, but it has to join up with a little buddy. So I'm going to put the first two beads on. And I want to be one bead in depth and one bead of space away. And I'm coming up in between my two outer rows. I'm doing this because if I come to the edge, I could, you know, it could weaken it or it could tear through the, the materials that I'm using. I don't definitely don't want to do that. So when you do the single beaded edge, the bead that touches the edge, so this bead is going to come down and it's going to touch the edge. You're going to go up through the bottom of that bead. So you're going up through the bottom of that bead. And when you do this, the thread should always be coming out the top away from the edge of what you're sewing. I'm going to put another one on. So the bead always goes on first. And I'm one bead in depth, one bead away. I'm going to come up. And then you're going to see how I come up through the bottom of the bead. So I'm literally where the bead touches the side of my feather. I have to go up through the bottom of that bead like that. And my thread will also be coming out away from the edge of my feather. So it'll always be coming out away from the edge of my feather. And it doesn't hurt to pull on this. You want to make sure you pull on your edging as you're going. One bead in depth, one bead away. Of course, I'm going to be in between those rows that I've done. I'm going to come up. And I'm going to go up through the bottom of the bead only. So I'm going up to the bottom of the bead, the needle is coming away from the edge. So is my thread. Like that. And so I'm going to keep going. I'm just checking on the back, making sure that I'm catching everything. And again, I use that same spacing come up and come up through the bottom of the bead so that my thread is coming out away from the edge of the feather like that. So basically at this point I just keep going around till I meet up where I started and that first two beads that I put on there this last bead ends up having to be anchored as I go around. So on the finished example, I, I finished over here. And the reason I know that is I can actually see the double stitching. So I believe this was the bead that I started with. So once I anchored it, then I had to carry on through four beads before I could come out the back 
and cut my thread. I always poke out the back and cut my thread and let it hide itself. So you go all the way around. When you get to where you started, you have to stabilize that first bead, come ahead four beads, going sewing through them exactly the way you would when you sewed them on the first time. You can see those stitches there. Draw my thread out through the backing. Of course, you got to not hit the barrette, um, pull it out and, and snip it off. Um, and that's, that's the best way to, to finish this. Uh, then you don't need any knots or anything like that. It just, it just is what it is. It just stays, stays together with that edging. And there's where I, I went through the four beads over here. And again, you can see that because of the double thickness of my thread. And I always try to do it kind of somewhere a little bit inconspicuous so it doesn't look doesn't look uh, too um, obvious. So Danielle, can we check yeah. in with everyone and see if they everyone have any is, questions? In the chat, you're, it's full of thank yous and wow, and this is the most beautiful design. And I just, I personally want to thank you for taking time to show this because I did not know these techniques and it has been so inspiring to see. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, Danielle. And I want to thank again everyone for sharing their afternoon with me. Chi make witch, as we say in my language. Big thank you. And um, happy beating. <laughs>